one application of the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization process is the QR decomposition of a matrix. Here, we'll give an explicit formula in the two by two case. So, will A be a real two by two matrix? We'll factor A as Q times R, where Q is orthogonal. Recall that means Q transpose equals Q inverse. And R is upper triangular. So that means the entries below the main diagonal are equal to zero. In our first case, we'll assume that A is invertible. So if I consider the columns of A, column V1 and V2, form a basis for R2, then we can apply the Gram-Schmidt process to our basis. The equations that come out, when we put them in matrix form, we'll get a QR decomposition for A. Now, if I want an explicit formula, it'll be more straightforward to just take a Q and an R, multiply, set it equal to A. If we want the Q and R to be unique, we'll assume that the determinant of Q is equal to one, and that the entry in the upper left-hand corner of R is positive. Before we give the explicit formula, let's justify the assumptions on Q and R. First, a special form of Q when the determinant is equal to one. Now, an equivalent formulation of orthogonal is that Q transpose times Q is the identity matrix. If we decode each row times column multiplication. That just says that the columns of Q are going to form an orthonormal basis of R2. Now, that means our columns are going to be unit vectors. The unit vectors in R2 are going to give us the unit circle. So that means our first column vector, call it V1, is going to be the form cosine theta, sine theta for some theta. If we want a vector that's orthogonal to V1, well, I can switch the entries, negate the first one, and then I'll get a second choice by just multiplying that vector by minus one. So we'll have V2 equal to one of plus minus minus sine theta cosine theta. To get determinant equal to one, we'll let V2 be equal to minus sine theta cosine theta. So if we put V1 and V2 in as the columns of our Q, take the determinant, we get cosine squared plus sine squared, which is equal to one as we hoped. Now, let's see that we get the uniqueness. So if I suppose A factors as Q1 R1 and Q2 R2, can multiply by inverses to get the Q's together and the R's together. I'll leave it to you to show. Q2 inverse times Q1, it's gonna give me another orthogonal matrix with determinant equal to one. If I take R1 times R2 inverse, we're gonna get another upper triangular matrix. We'll have the upper left-hand corner also positive. Now, if these two matrices here are equal, then we know this product is gonna be in this form, this product is gonna be in this form with X positive. Now, if that happens, the sine of theta is equal to zero. So that means theta has to be equal to zero or pi. And then that means these two matrices have to be equal to plus or minus the identity matrix. Now, since X is greater than zero, okay, this upper left-hand corner entry, that means we're looking at the identity matrix for both of these. So if each of these is equal to the identity, we can push the inverses back over. We have Q1 equals Q2 and R1 equals R2. So our factorization is unique. First, let's find the entries for our upper triangular matrix R. So we'll take our product. So I have A equals Q times R. We'll call the columns of A, V1 and V2 columns of R, W1 and W2. A third equivalent condition for Q to be orthogonal, if I take the standard inner product of V and W, if I apply Q to V and W, the standard inner product will be unchanged. So that means if we decode the products for each of these columns, we have that V1 is equal to Q times W1, V2 is equal to Q times W2, and then we just apply this rule. 
So we get the three equations. The length of V1 squared is equal to the length of W1 squared. The length of V2 squared is equal to the length of W2 squared. And the inner product of V1 with V2 equals the inner product of W1 and W2. Now, if we decode those in terms of the entries, one says x squared equals a squared plus c squared. Since we're assuming x is positive, that means x equals square root of a squared plus c squared. For two, we have y squared plus z squared equals b squared plus d squared. Then three says x times z is equal to ab plus cd. Since we already know what x is, that gives us z, which is equal to ab plus cd divided by square root of a squared plus c squared. Now, to get y, we could use these three equations applied to two, but slightly easier way is just to use the determinant. So if we're gonna factor a as q times r, if I take the determinant of both sides are equal, then I can apply the product rule to the right-hand side. Now the determinant of a is ad minus bc. If we take the determinant here, we can use the product rule. We're assuming the determinant of Q is equal to one, so that means this determinant is equal to the determinant of R, which is just a product of the diagonal entries, which is X times Y. So if we move the X to the other side, we're gonna get Y equal to AD minus BC, divided by the square root of A squared plus C squared. So that gives us our entries for our upper triangular matrix. Once we have the entries for R, the entries of Q follow immediately. So if we take the product a equal to Q times R. We only need the first column of R. That's enough to get us the cosine and sine, and then all the entries of Q. So if we take this product, set it equal to A, well, the cosine is equal to A over square root of A squared plus C squared, and the sine is equal to C over square root of A squared plus C squared. Okay, and to check, the sum of the squares of these two is equal to one. Now, that gives us our formulas for Q and for R. So of course, you should check that this is an orthogonal matrix with the determinant equal to one. For R, we have an upper triangular matrix with the upper left-hand corner entry positive. Finally, you should check that A is equal to Q times R. Now, of course, we should put a numerical example through this. So let's use A equal to 3, 1, minus 4, 1. So if we run these numbers through our two formulas here, we'll get that Q is equal to 3 fifths, 4 fifths, minus 4 fifths, 3 fifths. R is equal to 5 minus a fifth, 0, 7 fifths. Of course, again, you should check that A is equal to Q times R. Finally, let's consider when the determinant of A is equal to 0. We'll have two cases. First case, we assume the first column of A is exactly zero. Here, A is already in upper triangular form, so I'll just let R be equal to A, and then we can have Q equal to the identity matrix. This factorization is not gonna be unique. In fact, we can have a factorization with any Q that we like. So the idea is gonna be, if I take our second column vector, again, it's a vector in the plane, I rotate it through an angle, that gives me the R, for the Q, we're just gonna rotate in the opposite direction. So that'll give us A equals Q times R. Now, in our second case, we'll assume that our first column's not exactly equal to zero. To get the determinant equal to zero, that means our second column vector is just the multiple of the first column. If we push that through our old equations for Q and R, we get same equation for Q, it depends entirely on our first column. For R, when we have the determinant equal to zero, we collapse to this form here. Now, this factorization is gonna be unique with our assumptions. So the idea is gonna be, the Q is unique because it's determined entirely by the first column. So the only thing that could change is the R that we use. So if we suppose we have QR1 equal to QR2 equal to our A, there's a few ways we can go to show that R1 is equal to R2. The way we'll do here, we can push everything to one side, factor out a Q. 
So we have Q times R1 minus R2 equals zero. So I have Q times a matrix equals zero. Here, we can pull out the columns, and that's just Q times vector one is zero. Q times vector two is zero. Since Q is invertible, that means both of those column vectors are zero. So that means R1 minus R2 is zero, or R1 equals R2.